Good afternoon and welcome to Meet Inquirer Multimedia. This is the monthly forum featuring the Philippine Daily Inquirer, Inquirer.net, Radio Inquirer, Inquirer Bandera, Cebu Daily News, Inquirer Libre, and our social media and mobile platforms. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, Viber, Line, Kakao, FireChat, WeChat, and Telegram at hashtag DFA Manalo meets Inquirer. There will be a delayed broadcast on Radio Inquirer, 9.90 a.m. at 7 tonight. For our 15th episode this afternoon, we are fortunate to have our country's number one diplomat as our guest. This year is very important for the Philippines in the international stage. We are hosting the ASEAN Summit, coinciding with its 50th founding anniversary. Likewise, as we all know, the Philippines is in the center of a regional sea dispute, and there are many other developments affecting peace and security in the region. Amid all this, we are comforted by the fact that the present head of the Department of Foreign Affairs is a true blue, well-respected career diplomat. We have seen how his appointment was welcomed by many sectors following the controversy involving his predecessor. We hope this appointment will be beyond acting capacity. Thank you, Secretary Manalo, for being here. We will have a proper introduction in a while. I'd also like to welcome our new acting sec spokesperson of the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, Rob Bolivar. To begin our forum, I would like to introduce our moderator. He is the associate editor of the Philippine Daily Inquirer and editor-in-chief of Inquire.net. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. John Neri. Thank you and good afternoon. Welcome again to Meet Inquire Multimedia. It is my happy task to serve as moderator for the next hour or so. Let me take the, a few moments to discuss the format. The format is straightforward. Secretary Manalo, our guest of honor, will be fielding questions from different members of the Inquirer group uh, representing the different platforms, as well as a few questions that we will select from the, uh, that will come our way through the different Inquirer social media accounts. Let me introduce our guest uh, properly. Please bear with me. I will do the voiceover because we had some uh, technical difficulties. So we will have a video introduction, but the voiceover will be live. <clears throat> that will be me. There could not be a better person to be the country's top diplomat than Acting Secretary Enrique Manalo. On March 9, the President appointed him uh, to replace his predecessor, Secretary Perfecto Yase Jr. A much admired and seasoned career diplomat, Secretary Manalo has served the Department of Foreign Affairs for almost four decades since joining the Foreign Service in 1979. His career included serving as Philippine Ambassador to the United Kingdom, non-resident Philipp ambas Philippine Ambassador to Ireland, Philippine Ambassador to Belgium and Luxembourg and Head of the Philippine Mission to the European Union and Philippine Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the Philippine Mission to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva, Switzerland. Diplomacy is in Secretary Manalo's blood. He grew up in a family of diplomats. His late father, Ambassador Armando Manalo, served as Philippine Ambassador to Belgium and political advisor to the Philippine Mission to the United Nations. His mother, Ambassador Rosario Manalo, the first female career diplomat of the DFA, was recently elected by acclamation as rapporteur of the Committee of Experts of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Despite having such eminent forebears, Secretary Manalo has carved out a name for himself in foreign affairs. As former Undersecretary for Policy, 
Secretary Manalo was at the forefront of addressing critical issues in foreign policy. He has outlined the most urgent foreign policy issues as the following. One, ensuring effective governance of maritime domain. Two, building disaster resilient communities. Three, securing critical and sensitive infrastructure against external threats. And four, protecting the welfare and well-being of every Filipino, both at home and overseas. Secretary Manalo has earned, uh, earned his bachelor's and master's degree in economics from the University of the Philippines. Um, he's married to Pamela Luis, and they have two sons. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce to you Acting Foreign Affairs Secretary Enrique Manalo. <laughs> Secretary Manalo, again, welcome to the Inquirer and to Meet Inquirer Multimedia. As I explained, the format is straightforward. Uh, you will be fielding questions from the floor. The first question will come from Inquirer uh, Day Desk Editor Mike Lim Ubak. Good afternoon, sir. It's a pleasure finally meeting you in person. You've been uh, in the Foreign Service for quite some time, and uh, uh, it's quite big shoes you have to fill from uh, the illustrious Romulus and then. Uh, of course, uh, before uh, Yasai. And so, how do you intend to, to, to carry out the president's mandate to have an independent policy, and yet we live in a, in a world that's very much interrelated? Well, thank you very much. First of all, to, uh, to thank the uh, choir for inviting me here to your regular round, and uh, certainly it's a great pleasure to be in a this position, and of course, to thank you for your uh, very kind introduction uh, to me uh, here, and just to say how uh, pleased that we could be here today, and certainly it's an opportunity to uh, exchange views uh, with the people here. On the particular question, well, it's true we've, uh, being the head of the Foreign Office, uh, you know, we have had a long history and uh, uh, plenty of big shoes to fill, but I'm uh, confident that uh, with the support of a very professional and dedicated uh, group, of officers uh, in the Department of Foreign Affairs, we will be conti uh, continuing our tradition of uh, upholding uh, uh, our professionalism and dedication to promoting the interests of the country. So I'm, I fully appreciate the support I'm getting from our people. Uh, it's true, uh, the Philippines now, one of our main courses under, the <clears throat> under President Duterte is to uh, finally carry out an independent foreign policy. Of course, this doesn't mean that the Philippines will be acting alone on every issue. There are issues where we require international action, for example, climate change, dealing with terrorism. And uh, in that respect, we will be working with our partners uh, to advance Philippine interests. And it's in that sense, uh, when I say independent foreign policy, we will be trying to promote our own interests. But of course, in certain areas, we will have to cooperate. You cannot do it alone, even bilaterally, uh, whatever the issue is, whether it's on security or economics, you have to cooperate. But it will be guided by our national interest. And that's how um, uh, we should be interpreting independent foreign policy. It doesn't mean acting alone. It means acting in consonance with others where necessary, but having the national interest uh, at, mind, at heart. So for example, uh, there are many multilateral interests, which uh, I just mentioned, aside from climate change and uh, uh, confronting terrorism dealing with transnational crime, uh, and even uh, uh, promoting uh, uh, anti-trafficking in women and children. All of that requires cooperation in the international community. So it's in that sense that uh, we will be pursuing an independent foreign policy. Yeah, the, uh, and uh, by uh, mid-May, the China will be hosting its very first, I think, an international uh, event called the One, One Silk Road, reviving the old Silk Road. and. Uh, ASEAN leaders will be there, the president will be there, and only one Western leader, the Italian uh, prime minister. Would you advise the president to be there uh, as, a, as a member of ASEAN or as a president of the country? And what benefits would we get out of the whole uh, new arrangement in the area, in this global area, part of the, the globe, I mean? 
Yes, well, I, I think there'll be more than one European head of state. I, I'm not quite sure. I won't, but uh, that's my understanding. I think uh, the OBOR is a, an initiative of China to promote a greater economic cooperation, especially in infrastructure, which happens to be one of our main uh, priorities here in the Philippines. Uh, the, the whole idea is how to get the countries of the region to uh, see how we can cooperate on, on various economic projects. But of course, um, this will have to be, any project will of course have to be assessed by whoever wishes to participate in whatever project comes out of OBOR. So uh, naturally, we will have to see whether this, and I, I think there would be many projects, it just wouldn't be one. So we would have to assess whether this project is something that would benefit us directly, uh, something where the Philippines, for example, or the other ASEAN partners uh, can cooperate with China and whoever else wishes to join, uh, whether we can all benefit from this. I think we'll also consider whether uh, it doesn't duplicate what may already be going on. For example, the ASEAN has its own connectivity projects. So I see here really uh, looking at OBOR as a way of complementing, complementing what we are already doing. And I think it's also important to show that uh, we're, we're also on the road to having greater regional cooperation. This is also in line with our uh, independent foreign policy. So I think uh, all in all, the president is going. Uh, we have recommended that he go because I think it's important as a way of promoting regional cooperation and benefiting the Philippines where we think it will benefit us. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from PDI reporter, Janet Andrade. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, about the ASEAN, uh, what benefits will we have uh, from, the, uh, from, being the, uh, from chairing the ASEAN this year? Well, I hope to have a lot of benefits, but certainly uh, it's a big honor for us this year uh, because in particular it's the 50th anniversary of ASEAN. So we have had the uh, privilege of being chairman on this very uh, auspicious occasion. In fact, uh, uh, I brought with me some notes, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, before the Philippines became chairman uh, last year and uh, in consultation, uh, this was among all the various agencies of government, we decided that uh, under our chairmanship, we would have, of course, the theme of, uh, of uh, partnering for change. But I think more important is that uh, our aim would be to uh, try and accomplish a number of priorities or um, or uh, activities falling under certain priorities, which would benefit not only the Philippines, but also the ASEAN region as a whole. And I think most important is to have a people-oriented and people-centered ASEAN. In other words, how to bring ASEAN to the people. And when I say people, uh, not only the individual people in our region, but of course, even in the business side, our medium and small scale industries. I think it's very important that they participate, not only the big industries, but the, and then of course, how to promote peace and stability in our region, uh, whether it be maritime uh, peace and security or, or any other kind, uh, whether it be non-traditional security issues such as terrorism, uh, transnational crime, I think that's what we're trying to achieve. And also ASEAN resiliency, especially in the light of, um, natural disasters, climate change. ASEAN has to be in a position to, to respond. But most of all, also how to promote ASEAN regionalism and ASEAN centrality. When I say that, I mean uh, an ASEAN which plays a role, a key role, in promoting regional stability and also uh, contributing to global issues. And finally, um, connected to the uh, people-oriented is community building, especially uh, uh, building up the ASEAN economic community. So I think these are many areas which uh, uh, will benefit the people of the Philippines uh, as well as the people of ASEAN. And this is what the Philippines uh, is committed to pursue uh, during our chairmanship and will continue to support even beyond our chairmanship. Yes, sir, sir uh, going back to one of her priorities like uh, regional security, sir, uh, I understand uh, ASEAN will be prioritizing uh, the drafting of a framework of a code of conduct in the, in, in the South China Sea. Uh, how, how, what's the progress now? Well, um, I don't want to uh, prejudge, but I would say that it's very promising and uh, it gives us uh, uh, a lot of um, optimism 
that uh, we are moving in the right direction. I think uh, two meetings have already been held uh, among the ASEAN and China uh, at the uh, expert level, and uh, they have achieved uh, concrete and positive results. So I think we're moving forward in the right direction. We're making good progress towards coming up with a framework. And in fact, uh, I still maintain the hope that maybe by mid-year, uh, but you don't have to pin me down completely, but I think we're very hopeful that by mid-year, uh, perhaps we might have a framework on a code of conduct. Uh, and then, then, of course, from there, we proceed uh, to discuss a code. But at least, uh, maybe if I go a bit on the framework, uh, what the framework will, uh, if it's adopted, will most likely consist of uh, the key elements or key issues of a code. So uh, we will have broad areas of, uh, which will be included in a code, and uh, the next test will be now to put in the, the specifics. But at least we will now have a very clear basis uh, to negotiate a code of conduct. If you recall, we've been talking about a code for the past 15 years, nothing has happened. Uh, 2002, uh, nothing really has happened substantively except uh, speeches, etc. But now we're on the road, I think, to really uh, looking seriously at what are the elements and uh, now in, in a position, hopefully, uh, to embark on actual serious negotiations on our code. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, if I may ask a follow-up first. What explains the difference now? Uh, after 15 years of relative in action, why is there a newfound momentum uh, behind the, uh, well, at least the framework for the code of conduct? Well, it could be um, many uh, issues here, but I think, uh, I would say, at least from our perspective, I would say improving relations between the Philippines and China. I think uh, uh, bilaterally, uh, the president's visit uh, uh, last October to China opened uh, the doors we were able to restore uh, at least our political relationship and, of course, our economic relationship uh, to their, their previous state. And I think um, there's been a generate, general uh, increasing trust among the countries. And uh, it was, in fact, China which uh, really made a, a, a big move forward to, uh, to begin discussions. SAN has always been ready to discuss. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, China has come forth with a very positive attitude. And perhaps this could be due to uh, maybe uh, creating a little bit more trust. Of course, there's still problems, and we're not saying that, but I think what this, uh, what this really signifies is that we're now in a position to try and seriously have a code uh, or a framework, and in the process, talk about these problems, how to manage these tensions. And I think uh, there's been now a better uh, element of trust. But uh, of course, uh, and I think better political will. So I hopefully, uh, this will continue in the years ahead and translate into something very concrete. Um, sir, just to be clear, uh, it's the ASEAN uh, as a group working on the framework in dialogue with China, not just the Philippines, let's say the DFA. No, I, uh, you're correct. It is ASEAN and China, mm -hmm. and we're all working. That's 11 countries. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's what's uh, really significant is that with 11 countries talking, we've been able to make this is good progress. So it's not only China's position. We have to take into account the positions, too, of our ASEAN colleagues, our Philippine position. We have our own. So it's a matter of now uh, 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 negotiating and compromising. But I, we have really made, I think, uh, as I said, uh, good progress. In fact, that is very hopeful news. So it is possible that we might have a framework uh, by mid-year. I say it's possible. Uh, I wouldn't have said that last year, but now I can say it's possible. Thank you. So the next question is from Inquire.net Chief Reporters, Christine Sabilia. Good afternoon, Secretary. Uh, so from ASEAN, we'll go to uh, the European Union. Here's just a couple of uh, questions that are related. How would you describe the relations between the Philippines and Europe? Are the President's statements in response or referring to EU reflective of our foreign policy? How do we address the EU's concerns regarding human rights and the death penalty? And are we concerned that EU would impose trade sanctions on the Philippines? First, I have to say our relations with the uh, EU are good. Uh, and uh, certainly there are, there's lots of room for improvement, but they are good. And we are continuing our, our close contact with our EU partners. So I think uh, there's been no change. 
naturally, there have been some concerns by some European politicians on the program. And uh, we are uh, trying to give the, uh, the best picture of the, the, to the total picture of our, of our, our policies. Our relations with the EU still remain uh, uh, as they were and are very close. And in fact, we're working on even enhancing them further. Uh, there are uh, ongoing talks on a possible Philippine-EU free trade arrangement. Uh, so there's still, uh, the, that's still a process which is ongoing. So I uh, would just have to say that our relations with the EU uh, remain good and uh, certainly with, uh, and, and with prospects ahead. I, I forgot the last one. Um, the human rights. Yeah, you mentioned the death penalty. I think some European countries are um, advocating the abolishment of death penalty. And well, there, there are some people in the EU and some countries, but uh, as we say, that's an issue now that our Congress uh, is dealing with. So we will leave it up to the wisdom of uh, Congress on how we will go there. So we will just have to wait and see what the eventual uh, decision of the uh, Congress will be. Uh, as I said on human rights, you know, there are. We always deal with the EU on human rights. In fact, uh, uh, it's a two-way process, uh, you know, and we always uh, like the EU, and the EU knows the Philippines is already a party to at least 27 or 28 human rights conventions, and uh, we have continuously uh, exchanged information with the EU on our implementation of them, and I think uh, there's really nothing different. We've been doing that for years, just like we also uh, see how they are implementing their own conventions. So I think Really, there has not been anything new. We've been doing this for years. Last follow-up. Do you think it would come to the point of trade sanctions from the EU? Well, it's very hard to say. I mean, I don't see why. I mean, uh, we have a very excellent trade relationship with the, EU, uh, with the EU, not only as a whole, but individually. We have excellent cultural relations. We have a half million Filipinos, perhaps, living in Europe who are contributing. So I think we have a very robust relationship. And I'm, at the moment, uh, I think we are trying to maintain that and build on it. So regardless of what happens in the political front, our trade relations with you would be strong. We'll continue. Well, I, I think it's uh, even the fact that they gave us a generalized system of preferences uh, plus uh, indicates how they view the Philippines as a... Uh, as an important uh, partner. And uh, in fact, increasing investments from some European countries, and of course, increasing trade, not only bilateral, but even with ASEAN and EU. I think they really view this region as uh, something uh, which is very important. And of course, our relationship I is multidimensional. It's uh, political, economic, cultural. And I think all governments and countries uh, take that into account. And you know, now and then, like even marriages or boyfriends and girlfriends, you have little differences, but ultimately it's the total relationship which counts. Um, thank you, sir. I have a follow-up about that, but I'd, I'd just like to call the next three. Uh, the next three questions will come from uh, Chito De La Vega, Editor-in-Chief of uh, Inquire Libre, uh, and uh, Angelique Jordan of Raja Inquirer, uh, Billy Vega, is he here, of Inquire Bandera, um, and then after that, um, J.V. Rufino of social media. But uh, I have a question about Brexit. Um, since we're in the topic of the EU, how will this impact Filipinos? Uh, I was assigned in the UK, and the Philippines part of the uh, UK, uh, overall UK community. They contribute a lot. Many of them have... We'll have to see what happens uh, during the uh, at the end of the negotiation. just UK. Uh, the remaining ending the same law citizens. But again, I'm, I'm just guessing. They may in the end uh, retain some aspects. So uh, I, I think uh, we will be monitoring very closely. And, uh, but uh, I think uh, insofar as the UK is concerned, uh, the Philippines has been uh, looked as a very close partner, and uh, our community there is an important part of the UK community. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Chito De La Vega, Editor-in-Chief of Inquirer Libre. Uh, I don't know if this uh, is uh, a possible, because you said about the framework of the Code of Conduct was not imaginable last year, but is a, such a thing as an ASEAN, single ASEAN currency imaginable now? 
it's imaginable, but <laughs> uh, I suppose maybe our finance people would have been in a better position. But as far as I know, uh, perhaps uh, the focus now more is on increasing trade uh, and then uh, goods and then eventually services. And I think perhaps, I think discussions have been held. I've not been involved in them. But there's been no real, uh, let's say, concrete proposal. But I think uh, once the ASEAN uh, economic integration ends and gets eventually, there may be. Uh, but so um, naturally, I think that will be uh, come naturally once the conditions are really there, and I think they will start seriously looking at. But I mean, there have been talks about an a single ASEAN currency, but. Uh, I don't see any uh, actual negotiations taking place soon. I mean, at least this year. So. You mentioned about integration. Uh, how how is the how will the as an ASEAN integration benefit an OFW and also, I mean, Filipino students because most of the schools have adjusted their calendars towards an international. Uh, will will an ASEAN integration also benefit the Filipino students and the Filipino schools? Well, we're, we'll be going step by step. First, we're working on the ASEAN economic community, which is more on trade than eventually services. Once, perhaps, uh, if services can be liberalized, then eventually professionals can move back and forth. I think, uh, and then, as I said, as this deepens, then we'll probably be looking into further types of integration. But at the moment, the, the emphasis really is on ASEAN economic uh, cooperation and expanding not only trade, but looking now more on in expanding investment. But this doesn't mean that we aren't talking also uh, with our ASEAN partners on the aspects that you have put through. But to, to make this region-wide, we will have to make it 10. Bilaterally, talks are going on, of course. But to make it 10 may take a little bit, uh, a little bit longer. But definitely, it's part of the ASEAN community building vision uh, for uh, 2040. So uh, all these aspects. But you know, uh, we'll have to be looked at. But we have to, we, we, you know, um, integration is a process and we have to see how things develop. We cannot rush things. I think what's ripe for the picking, that's what we focus on, then move to the next, bearing in mind the overall plan of uh, eventual integration. We want to be careful that uh, we don't make any missteps and that, uh, remember now we're 10 countries. Musana, if we were only two or three, it might be easier, but now we're 10 countries. With ten, uh, with ten uh, governments, and uh, so the, you know, it, it's uh, something which will have to be negotiated. But certainly, that's in the vision. So the, to be deliberate, it's, it's intentionally to be uh, it takes longer. You uh, well, I wouldn't say uh, intentionally longer, but I mean the, you have to have the agreement to move forward on that. And right now, uh, lots of the focus is on the economic community. That took some years. Uh, and that's trade and goods and services. But as I said, uh, that's on the agenda, those points, and they're being discussed. But I think before we get into formal negotiations on that, we, a lot of the other priorities have to be developed because there are quite a number of priorities that ASEAN has to address. But ultimately, the vision is to have a community of, of uh, what you're talking about. Uh, if I have one last. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if I've had a, a problem with my hearing, but I never. I, uh, lately, I haven't been hearing the term West Philippine Sea, and most of the time I keep hearing South China Sea. Is this intentional that we don't talk about? I mean, meron hubang sinasa japu ba na hindi na nababanggit ang term na West Philippine Sea, or talagang masama lang ang pandinig ko? <laughs> No, no, West Philippine Sea pa rin sa, sa atin, but of course some other countries call it South China Sea. But uh, we, it's, to us, it's West Philippine Sea. Uh, China has another name, it calls it South China Sea. So, uh, Vietnam calls it the East Sea. And uh, yeah, Vietnam, Vietnam calls it the East, East Sea. East. So, uh, no, I wouldn't touch uh, anything significant. It's still West Philippine Sea to us. And it's still law. I mean, there's still a Republic Act yeah. uh, renaming it. Uh, next question is uh, Angelique Jordan from Raja Inquirer. Hello, sir. Uh, going back to ASEAN po, uh, uh, paano po natin nasisecure yung, seg yung security pa na sa nalalapit po na ASEAN meeting, lalo na po sa Bohol? Kasi di ba, nito lang po, ang South Korea ha hanggang uh, 23 po. 
Sorry. Well, uh, the meetings will go on in, in, in Bohol. That's all I can say. They will be held. Um, you're, you're working closely with the AFP uh, on the... Yeah, well, uh, the, we have the ASEAN National Com uh, Organizing Committee mm -hmm. uh, who's in close contact uh, with them. Uh, the DFA is not uh, directly involved in the... Uh, it's the it's the ASEAN National Organizing Committee, which is uh, a much bigger group. But the meeting will go on. Pagdating po sa ibang sa ibang issue, there are uh, cases po na nare-receive daw na uh, pagdating po sa filing ng online application sa website po ng DFA, yes po, there are, um, meron daw po delayed na two months. Yes po, paano po kaya natin i-address tong issue po na to? Well, we are trying to address it. I just want to, uh, to say though that we have thousands of applications hitting that. And that uh, means that the technology itself uh, cannot handle. We're seeking to how to improve our technology. Ang masasabi ko lang is every day, uh, DFA is trying its best to, to handle all these uh, applications plus our other consular work. And uh, talagang dedicated na mga tao natin dyan. It's just we have the, uh, we have resource limitations. But ang dami nag-apply talaga na which is fine. And so we have to really see how we can improve our uh, capacity to uh, to absorb that. But let me assure you, if there's a delay, it's not because of negligence. Because if I find out about that, I'll be the first to uh, to uh, tell them off. It's really more on the uh, capacity, the technological needs, which we're also seeking to have improved uh, uh, resources para ma, ma, ma implement yan. But we are doing our best, I can assure you that. And uh, if there's any delay, it's not intentional, but uh, it's really due to other constraints. Thank you. Uh, something just occurred to me, Secretary. Um, I don't know if the answer is, in fact, uh, there to be had, but about how many Filipinos have passports? How many Filipinos have the capacity to travel abroad? <laughs> Do we have that? I, I don't have that zero, but I'm, <laughs> I, I'm I, sure there, wait, can I say, what, millions? There must be millions. Millions, I mean, there, yeah. There, there are millions, at yeah. At least 10 million Filipinos abroad right now. And you know, uh, yeah, we have uh, we have uh, millions abroad. You know, I'm living abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not even including traveling. And I think with an improving economy uh, and improving conditions, you know, more and more Filipinos are traveling as tourists. That's true. Uh, in Europe and everywhere. So it's really part of the, uh, I'd say, uh, the trend of globalization. Everyone is traveling, and everyone needs to have a passport. So you can imagine how, uh, I, I don't know my figures, but sometimes we get 14,000 applications a day. A day. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's just part of globalization. And sure. It's just we uh, we need, we just have to respond as best as we can. Sure. If, if you can get, give us a number, yeah, yeah. that would be nice. We'll give you a, a figure on that. Uh, okay. Something like 50% of the Philippine population can travel abroad or something. Uh, Billy Begas is not here. Okay, so we'll have the first of uh, two questions. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll just have two questions first from social media. Uh, care of our director for mobile, uh, JV Rufina. Uh, one question from uh, Ron Kalun. That's his Twitter handle. Uh, can you confirm that the president is returning to Japan in June? Will he meet again with Abe? Well, uh, the president plans to be uh, in Japan uh, at the moment. He's been invited to attend the Nikkei conference. Uh, but the, the actual details of the other events are still being worked out. And then uh, another question. Uh, as you know, there's a bit of tension right now going on in the Korean peninsula. How does the Philippines see the current tension in the peninsula? And are there... Any plans for the Filipinos who are currently living in South Korea? Well, first on the second question, the, the embassy is uh, fully abreast of developments and we, we have plans and evacuation plans if required. Uh, now on the bigger issue of, uh, certainly it's our hope that uh, the parties can uh, enter into dialogue. I think that's the, the, uh, the way, uh, the only way out. I think we have to reduce the tensions because uh, uh, certainly, we're afraid of any possibility uh, of a miscalculation, etc. So, all it's really important that uh, the parties uh, involved really get together and see how we can promote a dialogue to see how to address these issues before uh, we reach a stage where tensions become even higher. So, uh, I would have to say that we're certainly viewing 
the situation very closely uh, from our end. Um, James, be before you can ask the, uh, maybe you can ask the, the third and fourth questions, but I wanted to ask a follow-up about Korea. I, I know that ASEAN has played a role uh, that eventually led to the six-party talks. Uh, as chair of the ASEAN this year, uh, are we doing anything uh, to help resolve or reduce the tensions in, uh, in the Korean Peninsula? Well, certainly, uh, assuming that, uh, of course, hopefully, they'll be uh, lowered by the time we meet, but certainly that's a very important issue in our region. And uh, certainly, I expect that uh, certain ASEAN countries, if not all, will be expressing views. And I think the views will be mainly, uh, I would expect, uh, to see how the tensions can be reduced. And the best way of doing that is for the parties, uh, especially those uh, directly involved, to see how they can get to the table and discuss whatever issues are, are of concern to them. And, and uh, certainly not to have the situ situation uh, worsen. So uh, certainly this is an issue uh, which is of importance to us and I'm sure the other ASEAN countries. So I would expect that other countries would raise this during, this, during the uh, meetings and uh, we will have to see then how to respond. Uh, ASEAN has always been viewing the situation uh, carefully and, uh, but now with the increased tensions, we'll probably be viewing it more carefully. <laughs> Thank you. James? Okay. Uh, this is a question from uh, Toots069. Uh, how will the DFA reconcile the international courts ruling in the West Philippine Sea with uh, our president's uh, flip-flopping statements? Well, the president hasn't made any flip-flopping statements. I think he's been very, uh, he's been very uh, determined to improve our relations with China, but not at the expense of Philippine interests. And I think uh, that's been his consistent line. And uh, really, the only way to really resolve uh, differences is to talk. And I think his main point has been we have to open up uh, dialogue with China and create a better climate of trust. And you know, the arbitration ruling did not rule on the disputes. They provided a basis in the event that countries decide to talk. It could be, it could be used as a basis. But if you're not talking, uh, I think how can you resolve differences? And I think that's been uh, our main point. So I, I don't see any inconsistency. In fact, I think it's through the process of having better dialogue and communication uh, that we can uh, at least have a basis to discuss the differences. All right. Uh, the other question here is from Facebook, and it's actually just a comment that came in now regarding uh, ASEAN spirit in the Philippines. The comment was, Filipinos are not very ASEAN-minded. Frank about how, so how are we going to be instilling an ASEAN spirit in the Philippines? Well, one of our uh, priorities I mentioned earlier is to uh, how we can become more, how ASEAN, uh, at least the uh, officials, etc., can work towards making it more people-oriented and people-centered. And that's one of the main priorities or themes of the Philippine chairmanship. And the, because in the end, you have to involve the population, the people, and as I mentioned earlier, not only the people, but our, our businesses, our um, other professions, they have to become more aware of ASEAN. And I think that's one of our uh, uh, priorities. And I think the other ASEAN countries also agree. Uh, they also have the same, perhaps similar situations as we do. Uh, and I think, uh, I think, in fact, when you look uh, at other regional groupings, you have it's very clear that for really to really have a solid foundation for any grouping, you have to have greater participation and awareness of the populations. Because in the end, everything we're doing in ASEAN, uh, Philippines is included, is really for the, our people. And there's no other reason why ASEAN uh, is doing all of these projects and cooperation, uh, for example, economic cooperation, if not to improve the lives and well-being of our respective populations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have a second round of questions. Um, but <clears throat> Can I have one? A, a light one. Okay. <laughs> Question from Chito de la Vega. Uh, uh, tinatanong po ng mga bata, paano po ba maging isang diplomat? Ano po ba ang pinag-aaralan? Uh, pwede ba silang mangarap na maging diplomat din tulad? As aside from choosing your parents. Aside from uh, having parent <laughs> Well, uh, well, the best is to uh, 
<laughs> no, but I, I, I think uh, it's important. Uh, of course, you have to have the interest to be a diplomat. Uh, you know, I, I've always said uh, diplomacy is not a science, so it's something you have to develop. There's no uh, hard rule. You know, this you should do this, that, that. And uh, even in diplomacy, every situation uh, you can't predict. So I, I think uh, what's important is uh, first you kailangan mo ng interest talaga. You, I think in our case, you, you, have, you have to be dedicated to uh, providing service because in the end, we, we service the, the people, the, the country. Uh, I think you need some dedication and uh, a spirit of professionalism and uh, teamwork because you're guided by the interests of the country and the people and definitely not your own. Of course, important in a uh, you know, but but I think it's the uh, more of your character, and uh, if you if you feel you have that dedication, then by all means, of course, uh, get into some specifics. You've taken exam, but that, that comes later. Kailangan po ba magaling sa mat? Hindi naman kailangan pero mga issues, different bag. If I think the more um, uh, diverse. Uh, ideas and approaches we have, the better we can look at issues. So, hindi uh, baling on yung background mo. But really, what counts more is your dedication and uh, your professionalism. I, I also understand that, well, you have to hurdle the foreign service exams, which by reputation is as hard or even harder than the bar examinations. <laughs> well, that's changed. I took my exam th over 30 years ago, no? but that was hard enough for me, especially... Uh, essay pa. So be sure you write legibly. Yung pala, good, good penmanship. Pero ngayon, I don't know. Do they still write? Now on, how they still write? So yeah, important yan. Have good penmanship. Kasi uh, ang haba na exam na yun eh. So after one or two hours, eh, papagod ka na. And then, uh, you know, gana. But, uh, but even the exam, as you'll know, uh, well, as uh, um, it's different from the, let's say, civil service because ang foreign service exam is quite broad. They ask you all kinds of questions. Can be history, uh, foreign language, uh, uh, economics, and even current events. So uh, it, it requires some uh, a broad knowledge. Yeah, it doesn't really matter kung ano yung background mo eh. You just have to be aware of developments and, and things like that. So uh, it, it can be tough in that sense. Um, Secretary, let's talk about the President's uh, a very successful visit to the Middle East. Um, what, what was it that the DFA did uh, to help make that uh, visit uh, a reality. I mean, w this might give us a, an indication, you know, what, what is it that the department does? Uh, so, for instance, when the president visits abroad, uh, how do you come in? What do you do? Well, uh, of course, uh, normally, of course, our embassy is there. So, normally, the DFA and our embassy there uh, get in touch with the uh, the, the host government, for example, for example, uh, the trip from president to a country, uh, normally it begins with the embassy getting in touch with the officials there, and then their embassy here getting in touch with us, so we lay the groundwork. But, uh, of course, hindi lang DFA ito. This is a multi, uh, it is an interagency task. Because uh, normally when the president makes a visit, uh, it's a, uh, a multi-issue uh, approach where we discuss all aspects of our relationship. So, uh, uh, aside from DFA, uh, we normally have, you know, Department of Trade. Uh, we have also our other agencies, for example, depending on the issues to be discussed, uh, we would have Department of Health, you would have, uh, you would have our Department of Transportation, Energy. So this is a multi-agency uh, uh, affair and uh, who all support the president. Uh, what the uh, DFA does, at least initially, is to prepare the, the groundwork sometimes with the host government. And then, uh, pag na identify na kung ano yung mga issues, then the other agencies come in. So, as I said, this is a multi agency task. Uh, and of course, our embassy is there, so the embassy also uh, assists. Uh, so, that's why our embassy also plays a very important role uh, in the country that they're in, the president is going. So, uh, uh, visits uh, take a lot of work <laughs> and, pre and preparation, and also uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, Negotiating agreements uh, uh, in preparation for the the visit with the host country. So it's it's a, it's it's a um, I would say um, 
Herculean task, but certainly it's a task that has to be taken with the most seriousness to ensure that it's a success. Um, did everything go to plan with the Middle East uh, visit? Or were there some uh, pleasant surprises? Well, pleasant surprises in the sense that uh, it turned out better than I think many expected. It was a very successful visit. The president uh, was able not only to establish uh, good personal rapport with the leaders from Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Qatar, but we were able to, uh, to uh, sign at least nine, nine or ten agreements uh, in, in the three countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, in the bilateral meetings of the president with his counterparts, uh, there was agreement uh, on areas where we need to cooperate. And that included, really, the basic areas. We, in, we agreed to increase uh, further political and uh, security cooperation, especially against terrorism, for example. Economic cooperation, because uh, that's very important. Uh, uh, those countries uh, that the president visited, visited uh, certainly uh, create uh, or have uh, a lot of business potential for us, both two-way uh, trade and, of course, investments from their countries to ours and ours to theirs. In fact, we signed an investment agreement with Qatar. And, of course, on the social issues, I think what, which heartened, uh, what heartened uh, us, the delegation that was there and the president, was not only the, the uh, recognition of the, the leaders of the contribution of the Filipino community, of the, our workers or those who live there to their respective economies, but the good relationship, the people and, uh, and uh, the nationals there. But I think uh, they do recognize the importance of uh, our contributions to their uh, economies, their well-being and welfare. And I think that uh, created a good basis now for uh, expanding our relationship to include uh, more, a lot of trade and uh, more investment. Because there's a lot of potential. Uh, one last question about the Middle East visits. Uh, did the President have a chance to discuss with the King of Saudi Arabia the uh, peace talks with the MILF? They, they mentioned it, and Saudi, uh, of course, supported our efforts. Uh, the, uh, the King supported our efforts uh, towards achieving peace in, in Mindanao, and I think that was uh, also something... Uh, which we appreciated very much. So there, the all three countries fully supported our, our efforts. Thank you. So let's begin the second round. Mike Uba. Uh, sir, just more on the code of conduct. Uh, uh, what are the points so far that you have like some consensus uh, among the uh, ASEAN and China? China included in this, in this negotiation, right? Number two, what are the contentious points that you know, you have to iron out for the next, over the next two months. And does it include some fishing rights or exploration rights for oil? Is it all inclusive or just a, uh, laying the groundwork for such uh, discussions? Well, I'm uh, really in a position to divulge. When the arbitrary come into play in, in this uh, negotiation? Or will you not invoke it at this time, at this early stage? Well, as I said, that's uh, part of the process. Okay. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, all I can say is that, uh, well, I've said it already, that there are elements already where there appears to be uh, some consensus or a consensus, but it's not yet finished. And would be part of the transitory provisions would be how to compel uh, the parties on the table to to abide by what will be agreed upon? Well, uh, I'm just talking of the framework now. As I said, uh, the next step, assuming that my framework na, and then my mga elements, na, then your mga details uh, will come in. And that will have to be negotiated. So this is just the framework. Just the framework. Be, but uh, all uh, ASEAN 10 plus China are already involved in the framework. Oh, uh, yeah, they're involved drafting. in the negotiations, uh, ASEAN and China. And uh, if we have an agreement, or at least a consensus on the framework, that will involve all uh, on the framework. Just in the framework. Yeah. Then, the, as I said, the next step is now negotiating the elements, the actual content of the code. But based on the framework. It will be already a diplomatic uh, victory for everyone, I guess, if you have that one, right? Well, I don't know. You can uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. maybe ask me in May. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, Jeanette Andrade. Thank you. 
Hi, sir. Sir, going back to the president's visit to Saudi Arabia, sir, was the president able to uh, request the leaders uh, of Saudi to commit the sentences of uh, some, I think, 21 death row inmates? Uh, what the president did was uh, he focused on three cases. On the other inmates, I think there's a process which is still ongoing. But uh, perhaps the uh, Department of Labor might be in a better position. But certainly uh, uh, he did raise uh, those, which, those three cases which were uh, uh, ripe. But uh, perhaps the Department of Labor might be in a better position to explain that. Sir, uh, what are those cases? That's why I think uh, it's con I think the Department of Labor uh, would be, but I think it's confidential. We'd, I think uh, they would have a better uh, perspective on how to address your question. Thank you. The next question, uh, Christine Zavilia. What is the DFA's role in the reduction of Philippine-American military cooperation? And is there a shift in the relationship of the Philippines with the U.S.? Um, I don't know if um, some have noticed that the president was uh, had a different take on the U.S. during the time of President Barack Obama and now with Trump. Is there a shift there? And what is our foreign policy with the U.S.? Well, our foreign policy with, I mean, our relationship with the U.S. Uh, remains uh, strong. We're uh, treaty allies, and uh, we're in constant uh, discussion with them. Of course, not only on security issues, but trade, economic, and of course, uh, so our relations with the U.S. have, uh, have uh, remained strong, and uh, we are, in fact, I'm going to the U.S. Uh, in May, uh, with the ASEAN to meet uh, with the uh, U.S. Secretary of State. So I think uh, uh, all I can really say is that uh, our relationship uh, remains strong with the United States. Um, there are those who describe our relationship as if we're veering away from the U.S. Would you agree with this? Or are we just opening ourselves up more to other countries like Russia and China? We're not... Um, perhaps you've said it. We're not veering away from the United States. It remains strong, but we're also relationship mutual benefit and mutual respect. We move towards one country, it should not be at the expense of the other. That's how we're approaching it because we think by uh, enhancing relationships with uh, more countries, we in, in effect are creating more security for ourselves and uh, also perhaps also improving the welfare of the country. Sorry to ask a naive follow-up, but does this mean you will need to hire more people because <laughs> You know, you need to man more desks. Well, we have a bigger budget. <laughs> uh, we're also constantly uh, short of uh, people, but I think that's the way it goes. Uh, but certainly, uh, if we expand our uh, embassies, our presence, uh, perhaps in the future, obviously we will have to get more, more people. Thank you. So, okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Julia Tavellana, our central desk director. So just on the agenda of the ASEAN Summit, uh, because uh, we're chairing and it's the 50th anniversary, I'm sure um, countries would be looking at us. So um, I want to know how you think uh, this will be a memorable <laughs> summit, you know? How will it be different from the other ASEAN summit? And uh, it, because at the end of the summit, you, you issue a declaration. So what kind of um, substantive declaration are we looking at? to make this a really uh, 50th anniversary ASEAN summit? Well, we'll be doing our best to make this a, a successful ASEAN. Of course, we will have a memorable event already on August 8th. You know, uh, that's the official 50th, 50th uh, anniversary. But uh, we will really be hoping to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, reflect the six priorities uh, or thematic themes we have in one way or another. And we hope to, uh, to uh, have a, uh, eventually a chairman's statement and a, maybe a joint statement which would re reinvigorate or reassert ASEAN centrality in, in the region. And that's what we're aiming for. And we hope that we can, uh, uh, our other partners can also agree with this. Uh, I, think, I think the atmosphere is good. And I think we all realize that it's important for ASEAN to uh, maintain its solidarity, its unity, and its participation and centrality or contribution 
to the uh, various issues of the region. Uh, so I think uh, that's what we're aiming for, and uh, we're certainly very hopeful. And I think uh, uh, not only the Philippines, but other countries are aiming for that. And the president also uh, has said that ASEAN should increase its solidarity and its unity. So we'll be aiming for that uh, when we speak out on various issues. So uh, certainly uh, our chairmanship will be aiming for that. Okay, sir. And on the code of conduct, um, how do you think you, we can make sure that China will abide by it? Because in the past, 2002, they didn't really stick to that framework. Well, we will negotiate the framework uh, first and then move on to the code, uh, the elements. But all I can say is that uh, on that point, uh, China uh, this year uh, has already... Uh, come out very favorably towards a framework, which is a, a, a big difference, say, from last year. So I'm hopeful that uh, that political will and uh, trust can be carried forward uh, because the code is very important uh, in seeing how we can manage tensions in the South China Sea. And I think every, every country participating in the uh, negotiations now in the framework, later in the code, realizes that. Sir, last. Uh do you find it difficult, and how do you how do you explain the president to to other um, countries, given his uh, rather controversial statements? Well, I I don't think we're explaining. I think uh, what's important is that uh, they see that the Philippines uh, is uh, reaching out to countries, and that our policy has been remain has remained constant, and in some cases has even gone further and towards improving. Uh, we're reaching out to so many countries, and I think that's the key. That's how they view the president's foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Secretary, uh, just a few questions. Um, this one is clarif clarificatory. What's the difference between the framework for the code of conduct uh, in the 2002 declaration? Uh, well, that's an interesting question, because first we have the declaration of the conduct, uh, DOC, and uh, uh, that's already there, and uh, basically our position is we want it to be fully implemented. So that's still there. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, uh, the code will be the big document mm -hmm. because the declaration basically are principles. Uh, so uh, there's no inconsist inconsistency in what's going on. I, I, uh, so in other words, we are working also on the DOC, and in fact, not only Philippines, all countries, mm -hmm. but also all the same countries are also pushing forward on the framework and the code. So they will uh, complement each other for now. Uh, but then, of course, sometime in the future, once we have a code, hopefully, uh, then the code will be the That's big amazing. one. Yeah. But the DOC certainly is uh, part and parcel of what's going on now, and it's there. And uh, we, we, in fact, our meetings, when we meet with the ASEAN and China, our me we, we discuss the DOC plus now the COC. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, they're working together. And then we'll see at the right time how to deal with it. But at the moment, they're, they're there. They're, it's a very important document. So it's complementary. It's not a way to get rid of the DOC. No, no, no. DOC is still there. And then, uh, as I said, let's see how the situation evolves. But uh, DOC is there. And in fact, I said we're meet, we meet on the DOC, mm -hmm. all the 11. But at the same time, the same countries are at the same meeting sometimes, then discuss are now discussing the framework. So they are working, they are, let's say, symbiotic. Um, Secretary, the 50th anniversary of the ASEAN seems like an opportune time to think about expansion. Are you open to uh, East Timor? It's always been knocking on the doors of the ASEAN. Well, you know, the Philippines is always open. Uh, but of course, any decision has to have the uh, approval of all the 10 mm -hmm. uh, ASEAN countries. So. Uh, the issue here is uh, if anyone wishes to join, uh, it has to be by a decision of the 10. Uh, but let me say, in the case of East Timor, we are, uh, the ASEAN is studying its, uh, its application for full membership. Uh, certainly, we have talked with their officials. Uh, but you know, there's a process uh, that ASEAN uh, has regarding applications for membership and also for even dialogue partners. So right now, East Timor's application is undergoing that process. Uh, it involves uh, the secretariat and then uh, uh, making studies and recommending, then it 
goes up to the member governments to review the recommendations. So it's too early to say? I think it would be too early. Let's, uh, the process, though, is ongoing. That's, that's definite. And uh, let's see where it leads to. Um, Secretary, what's the latest on the tripartite agreement uh, with the Philippines, Indonesia, and, and uh, Malaysia uh, about um, piracy, terrorism in the, in the Sulu Sea, and so on? Yeah, that, uh, there already is the tripartite thing, and there's cooperation now. Uh, I think they're still working out, in some of the cases, the actual mechanics, the details, but the broad uh, agreement uh, is already there among the three countries, and that uh, uh, it's really now more on uh, the implementation. So uh, at least the political uh, commitment is already there. Um, do we have questions uh, from social media? Yes. So, more questions from uh, our Facebook and Twitter accounts through JV Rufino. Actually, these questions are from uh, Viber. From Viber, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, one question is, uh, what is this, your stance on the, uh, depart the DOFW, Department of OFWs? Uh, well, we will have to be discussing that with the various agencies uh, exactly on its uh, nature. So certainly that will be uh, under active consideration. Okay. Uh, is it true that there is a shortage of uh, foreign, foreign service officers? And if yes, how is this being managed? <laughs> well, we, we always seem to be short. <laughs> and uh, certainly we would, uh, uh, we're always under the... Uh, pressure to see how we can uh, increase the number. So we are attracting some within the constraints of our budget. Uh, we're, hope we're trying to get the best. Of course, they, as I mentioned, they have to take an exam and then, uh, of course, pass the exams. But uh, uh, certainly we're doing our best to see how we can uh, get the most qualified and the increase the number we have. Because in this globalized world, eventually, uh, we will need uh, to have a constant uh, number of foreign service officers available. So uh, what, what number are we looking at, sir? I mean, uh, if you were to fill every vacancy, uh, how many foreign service officers? Oh, we would need uh, a lot more than we have now. But uh, we are, that's why we're trying to do our best with what we have, because we have our budget uh, constraints. And uh, it's not just personnel. We have to provide uh, supply, you know, even the payment of the embassies, et cetera. So all of these are, are there, but uh, uh, I think I've been 35 or almost four decades, and I've never been in a year where I didn't hear that we have a shortage. So uh, we try and do the best we can with what uh, resources we have. Um, from also from Viber, is it true that there's already a long list of political appointments to diplomatic posts? Political appointments to the well, the president, of course, uh, it's under the authority of the president to approve. So uh, it's not as if there's a long list. Okay, and then uh, another question from Viber: um, Is there any chance the Philippines can withdraw from the United Nations? If yes, how? And how can we go back if ever it's a I don't know who asked that question. <laughs> Think about Vibers, it's anonymous. So Speaking we don't as know. the former ambassador to the UN and well, IO. The Philippines is one of the founding members of the UN, and uh, our policy now is we attach importance, of course, to the United Nations. It's, the UN uh, has plays a very important role in uh, not only promoting uh, world peace or international cooperation, peace and security, but even in the economic and the health fields. Uh, the UN system... Uh, ranges from intellectual property to, uh, to uh, labor, etc. So all of these are of interest to the Philippines. And uh, as, a, as a founding member of the UN, uh, it's really in our interest to participate because uh, here we are talking about issues of global concern. So uh, I think in the history of the UN, only one country has ever uh, left voluntarily. Uh, and then it returned. Okay, thank you. Um, Dennis, do you have a question? No. Um, maybe we have a few more questions from the floor. Yeah, the Cambodian, which the president will push into the Cambodian. 
Is the president pushing through with the uh, trip to Cambodia? Or the WEF. Uh, well, we have recommended that he go. Um, speaking of Cambodia, uh, the president has visited all nine uh, ASEAN countries aside from the Philippines. Uh, and I think at the fastest pace of any other <laughs> president. Um, was this on his own initiative or was it a recommendation of the DFA? I think it was the president's initiative supported by the DFA because uh, uh, in my view, my personal view, I think it's important that uh, once you, uh, you have a new administration to meet your colleagues uh, as soon as you can, you know, as soon as it's practical. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you allow it to, uh, if you take time and then uh, let's say only visit a few, then it could create, send the wrong message. So I think it's important that uh, you try and establish uh, a personal rapport and then exchange views. And I think the president has done that uh, with his nine uh, uh, peers, in the, his nine leaders. And I think I, I was win in the last one, Thailand and uh, Myanmar, and it went off quite well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important because uh, not only do they discuss, uh, you know, the uh, political issues, bilateral, regional, but they get to know each other better. And I think it's very important to establish a personal line of communication because it's always helpful to uh, to have that and not uh, and not uh, so in other words probably the sooner you can meet your counterparts the better um, a question about the UN um, we have a new Secretary General I think the last time a UN Secretary General visited the Philippines was in the wake of a disaster uh, Ban Ki-moon visited uh, Tacloban and before that, I don't know, I think it was Kurt Waldheim in the 1970s. Are there any plans to bring the new um, UN Secretary General to, to Manila? Do you know of any plans uh, uh, on the side of New York, for instance, to bring him here? Or? Uh, well, uh, there's no specific plan at the moment, but certainly we are uh, discussing that. In fact, uh, I'm going to meet this week uh, the uh, representative of the uh, UN Secretary General so I don't know, perhaps they will take that up. But I think uh, uh, the, the, the role of the Philippines in the UN is uh, recognized, and I think uh, certainly that we we'll probably see the possibility of having the UN Secretary General perhaps visiting here at some point. But at this stage, uh, uh, we will still have to discuss with the UN uh, officials. Uh, and in fact, uh, as I said, uh, one of them is visiting us this week. And uh, perhaps... Uh, we might be discussing matters such as this. But uh, uh, of course, uh, once that uh, happens, uh, of course, the, everyone would be uh, informed of that. Well, it's uh, 10 minutes to 6. I think we need to wrap up. But if you can indulge me, uh, Secretary, uh, I think everybody's dying to know what is your relationship like with the president? So you met him very soon after your appointment. Uh, and I'm sure you've, so you were with him uh, in Thailand and in uh, Myanmar. And uh, you've been in a few cabinet meetings. How did he share his vision of the Philippine foreign policy with you? Well, you know, it's not as if you talk every minute on this. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, what, I've, uh, what we've seen when he's there is he, in his talks with the leaders, he, he pronounces uh, what uh, the Philippines' uh, interests are and where he wishes to uh, promote cooperation, et cetera, with the other uh, the, with the countries of the, mm -hmm. the leaders. And I think he's been very consistent in saying that uh, he uh, wants to uh, have a relationship where the Philippine uh, interests are promoted, at the same time respecting the concerns of the other countries. And I think on the basis, especially of the visits that I have been part of, uh, fortunate to be part of, is uh, they really went off uh, quite well. There was a great meeting of minds on common areas of cooperation. And uh, I think, uh, as he said, his commitment is to the Filipino people and uh, to Philippine interests. And I think uh, that too was well understood by the other leaders. And uh, uh, they both, uh, in his talks, uh, outlined various areas of cooperation. That's why I think uh, what happened in this trip to the three Gulf states went a little bit beyond our uh, expectation in the, in the uh, way that uh, he got along so well with the leaders. And at the same time, so many areas of cooperation were discussed. And I think this is very important because uh, uh, that region where we have so many Filipinos living and working, 
uh, it's important that uh, we develop really much stronger, uh, closer ties with the, with the governments and the people in that region. And I think that's how the president has uh, expressed uh, uh, our priorities. And they're all consistent, too, with uh, what he's also announced uh, in a number of his statements. Maybe last question, Secretary? Um, oh, sorry, second to the last. <laughs> Aside from the uh, ASEAN leaders, uh, will the uh, other world leaders also be joining us during the uh, uh, ASEAN uh, summit here? Like the, the traditionally, the US, Australia, ASEAN plus three? Yeah, well, uh, this summit is ASEAN lang ito. So just attend, it's the November summit, the East Asia mm -hmm. summit, where which will be the biggest, uh, the bigger event. Uh, and that's where uh, we hope the leaders will be coming in. There, I think there are 16 members of the EAS, so that's where it will be uh, uh, the big, that's in November, the November summit. So uh, maybe I'll have more updates on that uh, before November. Um, Secretary, last question. Now that uh, Donald Trump is president, do you think a visit to the United States is in the cards? Well, uh, it's always a possibility. And on that note, I think we will bring this uh, Meeting Choir Multimedia Forum to a close. We'd like to thank um, Secretary uh, Enrique Manalo for uh, uh, making time uh, for this and for giving us um, candid answers to our questions. Um, to everyone watching on the different Inquirer platforms, thank you and good afternoon.